Good afternoon, everyone. This is Andy Taller from JCC Association. Um, we still have people logging in, but I thought we would get started because it is 2 o'clock um, East Coast and comparable time wherever you are calling from. Um, I, I am uh, really pleased to, uh, to be able to play a role in this, uh, in this webinar. We, um, we actually had an amazing response. More than 100 people um, signed up for the, for the webinar from 59 different Jewish community centers across the U.S. and Canada, um, which is fantastic. Um, also uh, worth noting that um, you all represent Maybe not every department. I don't. I don't think we have anyone from uh, early childhood department, but we've got fitness people, senior adult people, adult arts and culture. Uh, we have Jewish educators. We've got um, uh, execs and associate execs and program directors, um, and we have a wonderful presenter, Barbara Rayner, who's going to, uh, in just a, a minute or two, walk us through this webinar. Um, just a, a couple of logistics before, before we get started. Um, we are recording the webinar and we'll be posting it on jcca.org, uh, jcca.me, um, so you'll be able to access it afterwards. We'll also be throwing a copy of Barbara Rayner's presentation on jcca.me. Um, that's uh, the, first, uh, the first heads up. Um, because there are so many people on this call, um, you are all in listen-only mode, um, but we want you to take advantage of the questions box on the right. Um, so as we're going through the webinar, um, click on that box, send in your comments and questions, and we'll be monitoring that, and we'll have a, a chance towards the end of the hour to respond to as many of those questions as we have time for. Um, and, um, and lastly, uh, I just want to mention that, that we see this as the beginning of a process. Um, you'll be receiving a very short survey right after the webinar ends, asking for a little bit of feedback and for your suggestions on how we can be helpful moving forward. Um, and I can tell you that one, one significant step that's already in place is a, a professional conference, March um, 19 to 20, 22, um, where we have a fairly robust program around serving this population, marketing to this population. Um, Barbara uh, will be one of those presenters, as well as a couple other national experts in this area, and we will have both adult job track and conference-wide sessions uh, to help you uh, learn, learn more about uh, this important population. Um, so that's, that's my introduction. I want to now introduce Barbara Rayner, who is the principal of Rayner Consulting, the former executive director of Boomer's Leading Change in Health uh, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, Barbara has 35 years of experience working in the for-profit social impact and Jewish communal sectors, including roles as chief marketing officer in the Houston and Denver Jewish Federation. She's passionate about this population and the opportunities that they represent for Jewish community centers um, and has a lot of great information to share with us. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the, the call over to Barbara. Thanks, Andy. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. I'm very excited to talk with you. I, I wish I could see you. <laughs> um, but hopefully I'll see many of you um, at the professional conference in March. Um, I'm excited to have the chance to talk to you today about a subject in a population that I care a lot about, and that's adults 55 and over. And in the interest of full disclosure, I fall into that population. Um, and while we're not talking exclusively about baby boomers, boomers comprise the vast majority of this population. So I've organized this conversation into three sections. First is the what. Well, I'll give you a little background about baby boomers and talk more specifically about what adults 55 and over are looking for. Second is the so what, uh, and that'll take us into the nitty gritty of why you and your JCC should care. And third is the now what, which is where we go from here. And before I continue, I have one other quick disclaimer. Um, I'm not giving a lot of data today, 
But the data I am giving comes primarily from American sources. So I apologize to our friends in Canada for that. Um, but I do think that there are similarities between the two countries and certainly between boomers in the two countries. And so I'm asking you to please focus less on the demographics I'm sharing and more on the psychographics. Because even within the United States, the demographics are going to change from community to community. And so what's relevant to people in Portland, Oregon may not be relevant to people in Portland, Maine. Um, and demographics are changing all the time as well. The bottom line is that most communities have large and growing larger populations of adults 55 and over. And I believe it's more important for us to talk about how best to attract them rather than how many of them there are to attract. Um, so I don't think I have control of the slides, Andy. You sure? Give it a try. Let's see. Um, Yes, I do. How about that? Okay. Uh, so the 2010 S&P Global Aging Report concluded that no other force is likely to shape the future of national ec economic health, public finance, and policymaking than the irreversible rate at which the world population is aging. And one reason they drew that conclusion is because between 1946 and 1964, the United States experienced the largest population explosion in its history, which is known as the baby boom. The Depression was over, World War II was over, people were feeling optimistic for the first time in more than a decade, and so they started having babies in record numbers. And when it was all said and done, approximately 78 million babies were born during that four-year period. So who are baby boomers? Baby boomers represent the largest, best educated, healthiest, and most affluent population in American history. The leading edge of boomers turned 70 this year, and the trailing edge will begin turning 55 in 2019. Since January 2011, one person has turned 55 every seven seconds, and another has turned 65 every eight seconds. That means in the time it takes for us to have this conversation today, 450 more people will become Medicare eligible, and 514 will become eligible for the senior discount at IHOP. And the population will continue to age at this pace until about 2030. Now, I know that 2030 may seem like a long way off, but the truth is we're talking about less than 15 years. That's less than 15 years. And to get a sense of how long that is, Think back 15 years and about what you were doing then. For many of us, it seems like a little more than an instant, which is why what we're talking about right now is so important. I also want you to understand that this demographic shift we're talking about is not so much an age wave as it is a rising tide. It's not like boomers are going to get old, eventually die off, and leave a younger population behind. On the contrary, Baby boomers are going to get old, live a long time, eventually die off, and leave a population behind that also skews older and lives even longer, thanks to miracles of modern science and low birth rates. Over the past 70 years, the boom that began in 1946 has resulted in numerous changes and disruptions to our society, some of which couldn't be foreseen and others of which society failed to plan for, even though they came with considerable notice. Initially, there weren't enough hospital beds or bassinets to handle the demand. Then there weren't enough classrooms or school books or teachers. Then there weren't enough dorm rooms on college campuses. And in fact, I had friends who reserved their dorm rooms before they got accepted into their college of choice. And that was in the 70s when baby boomers had already been going to college for at least 10 years. So you would have thought that somewhere, at some point, somebody would have gotten a clue and said, hmm, we need to have more dorm rooms. But no, that has not ever been the case, um, which is why we're having this conversation, at least in the United States, about Social Security and Medicare right now. As I said before, thanks to the miracles of modern science and technology, people are living longer than ever. Here is what I believe is a mind-boggling statistic. Did you know that two-thirds of the people who have ever lived to be 65 in the history of the world 
are alive today. Think about that. Two-thirds of the people who have ever lived to be 65 in the history of the world are alive today. It's astounding. That's because until the last century or so, people didn't age, they died. Hospitals were not created as places for sick people to get well. They were created as places for sick people to die. And today, thanks to innovations like antibiotics, vaccines, and medical procedures, chances are people who live to be 65 today will more than likely live at least another 20 years. A couple of years ago, I was driving into San Francisco for a conference on healthy aging when I passed this billboard, and it took my breath away. I mean, think about it for a moment. The first person to live to 150 is alive today. That is true. That's what people believe is to be true. It's not to say that everyone is going to live to be 150. In fact, gerontologists think very few people will live that long. However, the fact that someone, anyone, will live to 150 is nonetheless incredible. So I have just a couple more statistics to set the stage for today. By 2017, which starts in three weeks, believe it or not, baby boomers will comprise half of the U.S. population and will control 70% of its wealth. Research shows the average age of the American Jewish community is about 50 years old, which is 10 years older than the average age of the broader community. This means that as a community, Jews are going through the aging pipeline first, which is why our communities, including our JCCs, must create ways to address their wants and needs now. So what makes adults 55 and over tick? Well, adults 55 and over are not a monolithic bunch. They have different backgrounds, points of view, belief systems, and goals in life, as you can tell by this uh, display of famous people, you know, who have contradictory points of view. As a group, though, they're interested in pursuing opportunities related to four common themes. Okay. Um, that's moving ahead, but that's fine. Uh, work, service, learning, and leadership, all of which are relevant to you as JCC professionals. Living life has given adults 55 and, ab and over an abundance of experience, knowledge, wisdom, and perspective. They are innovative thinkers, they are tenacious, they are disciplined, they are optimists, and they are effective problem solvers. This is a population that has seen the, been the engine behind some of the most significant social, political, and cultural changes in our society, from civil rights to women's rights to reproductive rights to gay rights, the list goes on. They were raised to believe anything is possible, and they still want to make a difference in the world. As a population, adults 55 and over are happy, not necessarily every minute of every day, but in general, and research shows they will continue to get even happier as they age. Adults 55 and over want to have fun. They want to reduce the stress in their lives, spend time with loved ones, simplify their lives, pursue hobbies, and just chill. They're done with acquiring stuff and are far more interested in engaging in meaningful experiences by volunteering, traveling, learning a new skill, pursuing their passions, being inspired, and getting involved in causes they believe in. But what are they worried about? Well, the truth is, life is not all fun and games for adults 55 and over. Their optimism and joie de vivre is tempered by a few ongoing real-life concerns that I suspect most of you will not find surprising. Chief among those concerns is health, their own health, their parents' health, their spouse's health, their friend's health, and even their children's and grandchildren's health. And when it comes to health concerns, Alzheimer's disease or some other form of dementia is the condition they fear most, more than cancer, heart disease, stroke, and all other diseases combined. Right now, 20% of adults 70 and over are affected by some type of cognitive impairment, and that number is expected to grow as the population continues to age. Adults 55 and over are also worried about their loved ones. 30% of all adults in the United States self-identify as caregivers. And that doesn't count those who don't self-identify, but who serve as caregivers nonetheless. 
for instance, the daughter who takes her mother grocery shopping because her mom no longer drives, or the couple who checks on their elderly neighbor to make sure she's okay and takes her to the doctor when she's not feeling well. And no matter how well-intended family caregivers may be, caregiving can take an enormous physical and emotional toll on the life of the caregiver. Ageism is also a significant concern for adults 55 and over. By definition, ageism is discrimination based on age. By practice, it includes the intentional and unintentional perpetuation of negative stereotypes, particularly of older adults, by employers, businesses, service providers, the media, and older adults themselves, among others. Ageism is so insidious that while experts in the field of aging see it as a significant problem, it often fails to even register as an issue among those who are either victims and or perpetrators of it. For them, it is simply an accepted and acceptable part of life. Not everyone ages well. In the first place, many people don't know how to age well, and in the second place, many never anticipated living this long. Studies conducted by Dr. Becca Levy at Yale University reveal that people who feel better about aging age better and live approximately seven years longer than those who focus on the downside of aging. Baby boomers have redefined what life has looked like at every stage of their lives, and they're not done yet. Because adults 55 and over have watched how their grandparents and parents were treated as they aged, they're rejecting, this is, I'm fighting with this thing now. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, let me start that again. Because adults 55 and over have watched how their grandparents and parents were treated as they aged, they're rejecting the notion that they're destined to be treated like doddering old fools. And they're committed to doing whatever it takes to remain healthy, engaged, and productive for as long as possible. And that includes learning how to age well. So we have a poll that we're going to send out to all of you, that, uh, sort of an Insta poll, and I, and Andy's going to handle that. And we'd like you to look it over and answer the questions and respond, and we will address your responses in real time. All right, so this, this poll is actually two parts. Go ahead and enter your responses to part one. And then we're going to give you another uh, few categories to to respond to. This is this is to uh, to make sure you're you're with us. All right. Give you another another couple seconds, and then we will look at what you said. All right. So here here are the results from the first poll. Um, I was talking. I was talking to someone today who uh, um, who has a, a group in Cuba as we're speaking. Um, that that was the the smallest percentage. Um, most of you, by far, are offering programs for adults in this peer group in these other four areas. So let's take a look quickly at the next poll. trying to get there. Hmm.
<laughs> All right, I'm having trouble accessing the next poll. I think rather than waste Barbara's time, we should just move on with the presentation. Is that okay? It's good. Okay for me. Sorry about that. I told you, I had told Andy beforehand I have very bad e-karma. <laughs> so, and apparently that's contagious. All right. So, All right. See, see if you can grab the presentation again. Okay. Right now I'm just seeing the poll. Oh, so we close that. Well, while we're, um, oh, okay. there it is. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So why should you care about all this? Well, you should care because historically Jewish institutions have done a poor job of engaging adults 55 and over. And quite frankly, this population simply hasn't been on their radar. NextGen has been the primary focus of our community for at least the past 15 years to the exclusion of virtually everyone else with the possible exception of young children. You should also care because when it comes to older adults, Jewish institutions have typically addressed the needs of the frail elderly by providing transportation, congregate meals, meals on wheels, and limited social programming. And as a few of you pointed out in your survey responses, that's not what adults 55 and over are looking for. You should care because who in your local community is better than your JCC at offering programming that speaks to the wants and needs of adults 55 and over I mentioned earlier. You should care because the best way for adults 55 and over to maintain physical, cognitive, and emotional health is by eating right, getting enough exercise, and staying socially and mentally engaged. And who in your community offers programs and services that tick all those boxes better than your JCC? And you should care because if there is another institution that's better at doing any of those things, you need to know why they're better at doing it. And, and, and think about it before deciding if you want to compete. Finally, you should care because adults 55 and over can benefit your JCC. Engaging them can benefit your JCC as much as it benefits the adults themselves. By building your capacity to do more, generating revenue through new programs and services, energizing the existing vibe by diversifying the populations you serve, and building your membership numbers and involvement over the short and long term. So we were going to go with the second poll slide here. Okay, I think, I think we're ready to go. Awesome. So as we move from the what what are the facts to what do we do about it? Um, let, let us know what, um, what are the challenges that you have in your, in your JCCs in serving adults age 55 plus. You may have wanted to pick all of the above. We forced you to pick the, your, your top choice for this. All right, let's take a look at what, at what uh, you said so far. Okay, by, by far, attracting enough participants. Uh, Two-thirds of you listed that as your, as your top 
uh, top challenge, um, followed by funding, um, something that we are, we're definitely we're sensitive to in uh, in developing this webinar, um, and uh, and and we saw from um, and we saw from the pre-survey that um, you you have the challenge of a very broad population where um, you know 55 year olds. Uh, healthy 55-year-olds, healthy 85-year-olds, um, and uh, and and more more frail populations at every population as well pre presents uh, additional challenges for you. So let me turn this turn this back to Barbara. Okay. All right. Um, oops. There we go. Um, so we've talked about the what and the so what, and now let's spend a few minutes on the now what. Um, based on the responses to the survey Andy sent out last week and to the survey that we just saw, um, it seems that the now what falls into two categories, attracting adults 55 and over and then retaining them once you've gotten them in the door. So as a marketing professional, a Jewish communal professional, and someone who's spent the past several years working with this population, I can say with absolute certainty there is no silver, bu silver bullet, no magic potion, no one-size-fits-all answers to the question, how can we attract more adults 55 and over? In fact, just as an anecdote, um, the project I ran in Denver, Boomers Leading Change, we ran an AmeriCorps project that just mobilized adults 55 and over as AmeriCorps members. And they have natural, national professional conferences every year just like the JCCA does. And so our guy who was running our project went. And one of the sessions at their conference was, how do we attract more adults 55 and over? And it was the most attended session at the conference. It was standing room only. They had to close the door. And when the speaker started speaking, he basically said, I don't know. If you came here looking for answers, I don't have any. So there you go. However, my suggestion to you based on my experience working with this population is, talk to them. Adults 55 and over know what they want. They're not bashful. Ask them what they're looking for, and they'll tell you. Invite them into the JCC for coffee. Take them out for lunch or a drink. Pick their brains. Ask them to take the lead. You provide the space and the support, and within reason, let them go to town. Resist the temptation to rein them in with responses using words like can't, don't, not or won't. Then listen to what they have to say. That way you won't have to guess about what interests them. You'll know. Not only that, they will help you if you give them the chance. Work with them to create generation specific as well as intergenerational programming. Many adults 55 and over are moving from their home communities to live closer to their children and grandchildren who've moved away. As a result, they no longer have their long-standing network of friends close by and are looking for ways to connect with like-minded peers in their new community. On the other hand, other adults 55 and over have decided to stay put. Even if their kids and grandkids live far away and are looking for way they're looking for ways to spend time with children of all ages in their home communities instead. Be flexible, especially if you're trying to engage them as volunteers. Adults 55 and over take their volunteer commitments seriously. When we were recruiting volunteers, we had people show up, you know, 15 minutes to a half an hour early for an interview in full professional dress with um, lengthy resumes. They really took this idea of serving others seriously. However, most still have jobs and or caregiving responsibilities and will require some special handling in order to create a win-win for everyone involved. Try to move away from defining adult programs by age. Let participants screen themselves in or out of your programs based on their interests instead. Some people are old when they're 50 and they're older when they're 80. And others are young at 100. Defining programs primarily by age can get into ageist territory and we don't want to go there. As far as how to connect to adults 55 and over, again, this is not all a one-size-fits-all proposition. From a marketing standpoint, I would suggest a comprehensive approach that includes old-school tactics as well as social media. According to Google, 83% of baby boomers use the internet 
first to find information they're looking for. So much, wait, I'm sorry, I'm reading this and I'm, I'm discombobulated here. They use the internet first to find information they're looking for. So make sure that your search engine optimization techniques are are up to date so that your JCC comes up when someone's searching on Google for, you know, activities for brain health or activities for fitness. I think boomers are the fastest growing population on Facebook, so you can use that to your advantage. Direct mail, print ads in your Jewish paper, and posters placed throughout your building can also help. I'd also suggest that you get out of your office, walk the building, introduce yourself to people you don't know, invite them to a program or to otherwise get involved. When it comes to the question, how can we keep them engaged once we've gotten them in the door, my answer is the same. Ask them and then listen to what they have to say. Give yourself permission to make changes as their suggestions warrant. This isn't rocket science. This is relationship building. It sometimes takes time. It always takes effort. Just dive in. The good news is this population isn't shrinking anytime soon. The opportunities to engage them are endless. Relax, be creative, have fun. I realize this is a lot to cover in a relatively short period of time, and the truth is it could be a day-long seminar and still not cover everything. But I hope you found this information to be both informative and helpful, and I'd like to leave you with a few final thoughts. The first is this is not just about baby boomers. Everyone is living longer these days, and the leading edge of Gen Xers began turning 50 last year. Thanks to the miracles of modern science, among other things, this age wave is here to stay. If we're lucky enough and we take good care of ourselves, we'll all be able to enjoy the blessings and benefits of old age. The truth is, the fastest growing segment of the population is adults over the age of 90. Congressman John P. Sarbanes of Maryland said, if we're not ready, this demographic wave will crash over our heads, a wasted opportunity. But if we anticipate the potential of the baby boomer generation, that wave can lift up our society and propel it forward. Clearly, it's taken us a while to get ready, but that doesn't mean it's too late, and it doesn't mean the opportunity ends with baby boomers. Boomers have taught us, if boomers have taught us anything about getting older, it's that we must begin looking at aging and the aged differently. Older adults offer our families and our communities knowledge, wisdom, and perspective that can only come from a lifetime of experience. If we play our cards right, we will all be them someday. So thanks again for your time and for uh, hanging in there with us today. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. So uh, please please use the, the question box. We do have a first question. I'm going to turn to my colleague Marla to, to share it with, with you and, and let Barbara respond. Right. It says, we live in a retirement-heavy city. We held several meetings with the nearby senior groups to get their input and scheduled a couple of programs they wanted. They boxed in every way, and we lost our shirts on both programs. How can we compete with so many senior options? All nearby casinos have senior days. We get so much attitude here. Is that exclusive to Las Vegas? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, I don't know whether it's exclusive to Las Vegas, although the casino thing certainly does weigh in that. Um, I will say, in, in all honesty, um, and I'm not intending this to be ageist, but I do think that um, this population seems to know what they want. I guess my reaction, and I can understand how you'd be so frustrated by this, is to go back and say, okay, you told us what you wanted, we planned what you wanted, um, but our attendance wasn't what we expected. Where, where was the disconnect? Um, I, I would really turn and ask them, and, and I will tell you this, I think it takes a lot of experimentation. I think, you know, when, we, when we're working in the next gen area, for instance, you know, we're throwing a lot of things against the wall to see what sticks. Um, and our communities have not seemed to, um, you know, shy away from um, throwing money at that issue because they seem to feel so desperate to engage next gen and younger adults and young families in you know doing Jewish and I totally get that but adults 55 and over are also looking for ways to connect to each other and connect to their communities and um, and I would say 
continue to try to try to throw stuff against the wall and see what sticks, um, and and see if they can't market them within themselves to to get them to come. That that would be my answer. I, again, you know, this is this is a challenging population to attract. It it just simply is, um, and I don't have a, any sort of magic answer, other than to try again. Okay, we're getting some more questions. 55 and older is a very broad age group. This is more of a comment. We were hoping you would focus on 55 to 70 age group. Um, so can you address why you left it open? Well, so I, I, 55 and over um, includes 55 to 75, but um, I think we need to stop looking at uh, this population by age and look at it as more uh, um, in terms of their interests, their desires, and their ability. Because there are some people who are 85 who are as excited about doing um, the things that you might want to offer to 55-year-olds um, as a 55-year-old is. And conversely, there may be someone who's 60 who's, who, who isn't excited about it, who's just in a different place. Um, I mean, you know, I I know a couple who, when I met them, they were younger than I am now, and they were old then, and they're older now. Um, on the other side, my grandfather lived to be 100, and he was climbing windmills when he was 85. I mean, he lived and worked on a farm. And so, you know, much of the dismay of his children, he was doing that, but nevertheless, he was doing it. When you look at age, um, that's why I was suggesting don't market a program by age because you want people to screen themselves in or out based on interest. Um, uh, so that's why I left it open-ended. Um, it, it's possible that in your community people over the age of 75 aren't interested in doing anything with anyone who's 20 years younger than them, but um, in many cases you will find commonalities there. For instance, in a sports and fitness center, you know, where you're talking about people needing to increase their bone health, um, improve their flexibility, uh, their balance, uh, all of those things that also tie into brain health, which is a concern for everyone over the age of 55. Uh, you know, Pilates classes, a beginning Pilates class might be applicable to anyone, or a beginning yoga class. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't target your market necessarily for those 55 to 74 and those 75 and over. That's why I did it. Um, if you can market based on interest and invite people in that way um, with the idea that you're never too old to be a beginner and you're never too old to learn a new skill or to meet someone new or connect, um, that's, that's, that's why I would do that. That's why I left it open-ended. I hope that helps. Okay, well here's another. Have they got money to spend? We are often told that seniors will not pay a lot for programming. Uh, I think some people have money to spend and some people don't. There are people who are, you know, on fixed incomes and um, don't have the flexibility to, you know, attend as many programs as they might like to. On the other hand, there are plenty of people who are looking for um, adventure and um, to learn new skills and to expand their horizons, pursue new hobbies, to travel, um, to do arts and cultural things, and um, they do have uh, significant disposable income. You know, I, a statistic that I shared earlier was that you know boomers control will control 70% of the nation's wealth next year, um, and they're not going from zero to 70%. You know, so I think again, it's we tend to look at these generations as monolithic. And they're not. You know, while we talked about boomers being the healthiest, largest, most affluent, um, best educated, um, that's in the aggregate. Not every baby boomer is healthy or well educated or affluent. And so I think we need to be mindful of that. Okay. We're thinking multi generational and about boomers as grandparents. Have you seen good programming with the, through this lens? So um, I'm going to talk more about this when we're together in March, but uh, I think intergenerational programming is really important. 
um, as well as generation specific. And when we talk about that, um, I think there are just a multitude of opportunities there. Um, I know that because I'm married to a JCC exec, and I know that um, oftentimes budgets are tight. Um, one, one of the situations that uh, my husband and I talked about at one point was this frustration in the early childhood program where um, they could never get all their teachers and their uh, assistant teachers out of the classroom at the same time during the school day because someone had to be in the classroom with the kids and they didn't have funds to bring in subs for the entire school. And so, you know, one of my suggestions was to train up a bunch of adults, you know, 55 and over as volunteers who could come in, be in the classroom regularly so that when you wanted to do an in-service, you didn't have to ask your teachers to stay late or to come in early or to take, you know, to cancel school for the day, which inconvenienced the parents. But you could actually bring them out of the classroom over a lunch hour or something um, while you had trained volunteers who were adults 55 and over, or I mean, it doesn't have to be 55 and over, it could be you know, 35 and over, but this was my population, um, who were in there um, in the classrooms with the kids. Um, so that's that, that type of thing where you've got, um, you're able to build your capacity to do more and um, engage adults 55 and over in meaningful volunteer activities and that is, that's where the win-win comes in. I think there are just a ton of ways to do that um, where, you know, we've got young adults who might be looking for, younger adults who might be looking for, you know, some mentoring and, and support from people who've kind of been there and done that. Um, people who may not be their parents, for instance, that could be, treat them in a different way. I think there's great opportunities there. I think there's tons of opportunities for um, adults 55 and over to engage with teens. Um, and uh, middle schoolers and um, people who are just getting out in the working world. There's just a ton of opportunities there. So yes, I think uh, intergenerational activities are important and research has shown that they are hugely beneficial to everyone who participates, particularly because little kids um, and even children who are in their teens, when they are exposed to sort of that multitude of generations in the same place at the same time, it becomes more normal. Um, a lot of times people are afraid to go around, you know, really old people because they, they seem feeble or whatever. But this normalizes that relationship and it creates a lot of lasting bonds. Um, uh, there's a, there's a, a thing going on in, in, uh, the, on the internet right now, virally, the story about this four-year-old girl who ran into an old man in the grocery store and sort of befriends him. Um, by being honest, and she said something like, "I, you know, I like your face or something," and they and they became friends. Um, and I think that there's a lesson there um, that you know we could take, learn from. Do you think there are facilities that are especially important to older adults? Oh, uh, well, uh, I definitely think that. Um, because that population is so concerned about health, I think that sports and fitness has an enormous opportunity here um, to engage um, adults 55 and over in meaningful ways. I just really do. Um, one of the questions that um, was posed during the pre-talk pre survey was, you know, how do we make them feel comfortable? And I think that's by inviting them in and uh, reaching out to them and letting them know that um, we know that fitness is important to you and we know it's important to brain health and create programs that respond to that. I, you know, you don't have to create a program about brain health and advertise it to adults 55 and over, learn about your brain health. You can just say, we're doing a program on brain health or we're doing a program on uh, balance or on flexibility. I mean, there's all those kinds of things. Um, so I think some sort of sports and fitness facility would be important. Um, I think, uh, you know, places for them to um, convene and to connect with each other um, are also things that um, adults 55 and over are looking for. I uh, ran into a woman um, who was just raving about a JCC in Arizona that she spent, you know, three months at every year because when she walked in the door, you know, there were people playing Maj, and the men were playing poker, and there was all sorts of things going on, and little kids were running around, and 
Um, so they liked that a lot. And uh, I know that, you know, in other JCCs that I've been acquainted with, on Friday mornings they do like a Shabbat sing, um, where all the preschool kids come out into the center of the JCC, into the big lobby or the central convening point, and parents are there and grandparents are there, and even uh, older adults who aren't grandparents of the children in the school, but maybe have grandkids far away but kind of want to reconnect vicariously, um, do that. So I would say those are the kinds of, you know, um, points of connection that people are looking for. There is so much research on the impact of certain Jewish experiences on the Jewish identity of young adults. Are you aware of any research that supports the hypothesis that we should continue investing in the engagement of Jew Jewish seniors in order to keep them connected Jewishly? And what tactics are most impactful for doing that? So I'm not familiar with research that addresses that specific question per se. But I can tell you that um, research was done by um, B3, which is the Jewish Boomer Engagement Platform, and um, the NYU Wagner School that looked at um, the engagement of Jewish boomers and other minority boomers. And one of the uh, outcomes of that research was that the Jewish community was basically missing the boat because we were not doing enough to reach out to that population and say, you're important to us, you mean something to us, we need you and we want you and we're going to program for you. Whether it's finding ways for them to volunteer or providing opportunities for learning for travel, you know, all those sorts of things. Now, in the first poll that we did today, you know, the vast majority of you guys said you do all those kinds of programs, with the exception being travel, and even 47% said you did travel. So I think that um, clearly you guys are, you know, already thinking about this. But um, you're an answer to that. One. one thing, one thing I can also say is in talking with a a chaplain, the Jewish chaplain at MD Anderson, um, and not to get maudlin here, but when people are faced with a health crisis, um, either their own health crisis or that of a loved one, they often turn back to their faith um, as a source of solace and support. And they don't necessarily know how to do it if they've been away for a while. Um, they may not have a rabbi. I mean, uh, the um, affiliation with synagogues and JCCs among adults 55 and over is definitely declining because they don't necessarily see the reason why they should stay. But there is a point in your life when you get older that you need, you may need a clergy person. And so um, the chaplain remarked to me that, you know, she often is asked to step in and sort of start at ground zero with them because they've become so disconnected. So I would say anecdotally, there is definitely value to keeping people engaged um, when they're over the age of 55. We have a Jewish senior singles group, which was advertised as 55 plus until earlier this year. The reality is the group is more like 70 plus. And new people in their 50s would come in, get mad, and leave. The core of the group are cheap, complaining, and no one wants to be a, quote, leader. <laughs> they used to have their own president, secretary, et cetera. The group has diminished from around 20 to 30 people to an average attendance of 10 to 12. When do you know it's time to pull the plug on a program that is not thriving, and how do you do this? That's, you know, it's, I'm laughing Without because, offending them. Um, <laughs> when I worked for a federation in Houston, the YAD director came to me and said, how can we get these 45-year-olds to stop coming to our events because yeah. our 30-year-olds are not interested in dating them and they're coming because they've kind of gone through their generation of people and now they're going <laughs> to the younger generation. So it's interesting to see that that sort of trend continues as the population ages. I mean, I guess my response would be to go back and ask the people who left why they left, um, what's making them unhappy, and then um, 
ask the people who stayed why they're staying. Uh, it is a tricky thing, uh, you know. Um, it's a very tricky thing. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't. When do you know how to when to pull the plug? I guess you've got to look at, you know, what's the return from a business standpoint. Are our resources, both time and um, and financial, you know, are they being used um, to the best um, of their ability to engage this population? It's funny though because, uh, you know, more than anything, people have said to me, you know, why isn't there like a singles group for um, adults 50 and over? And I, I don't because I wasn't a JCC programming. Um, professional, you know, my answer was, I don't know, like, why don't you guys start one? Um, so I don't really know w when that is. I, I think you constantly, constantly need to be looking at the effectiveness of your programming, and you need to judge. Is it worth doing this for 10 or 12 people? Is there a way to engage these people in other activities that maybe aren't quote-unquote sort of singles activities, but could nevertheless help them connect to their peers? I mean, that might be the best thing, is to not do a singles thing but to have it be a way that people connect to their peers um, through other programs, whether it's, um, you know, travel or um, some sort of cultural programming or some sort of learning experience. I mean, uh, you know, that may be an answer. I don't know. I, I hope that I, answered your question. I, I think it's more about looking at the effectiveness of the program and the return um, and whether that's where you want to put your resources. Yeah, I, I would just add that I, I know with, with younger JCC members, we talk about JCC careers. We're talking, we were looking at how, um, how we can keep people engaged with the JCC for uh, longer periods of time, uh, after their kids finish preschool, through camp, uh, and beyond, uh, how we can keep fitness uh, users engaged in other areas of the JCC so that they remain members. Um, and I, I think when we look at engaging 55 plus uh, adults, um, they may have dropped out, they may not be members, um, but the, the initial point of contact could be uh, a starting point for re-engaging them with the JCC and everything else that the JCC is offering. Yeah, I would also say that, um, you know, I didn't include this in the presentation, but I think a sobering statistic is that not too many years from now, and I don't know if it's 2020 or 2030, there are going to be more people over the age of 65 than there are going to be under the age of 15. So all this energy that our communities are putting into, you know, connecting with next gen and young families and the acquisition of, of, of young family memberships and early childhood and camps, and all, I'm not to disparage that. I mean, it's all really important. But eventually, the scales are going to tip where you're going to find that your membership, I mean, because the population is older, we're going to need to look to con sort of maintaining that continuum of engagement over a long period of time and creating new entry points for adults 55 and over to get back into the JCC because um, maybe they've left, you know, once their kids are in college and they're gone and, you know, like why am I joining this health center? I don't even go. Anywhere. So we need to figure ways that sort of um, resonate with them and to get them to stick with it longer. Okay, here's the final question. Are you aware of anyone trying to attract ex-hippie baby boomers, like myself, opposed to the more conservative Jewish approaches to JCC programming? So that's really interesting. Um, you know, it's funny because um, I think people sort of peg baby boomers as the sort of sex, drugs, rock and roll, hippy-dippy, you know, uh, psychedelic, tie-dye, flower children, and don't realize that, again, they're not monolithic. You know, if you put, look at the two candidates for president. I mean, you couldn't get farther apart from the political spectrum. You've got people who are really conservative, people who are, or, you know, like I would say, you know, you've got conservative whack jobs, you've got liberal whack jobs. I mean, and they're all baby boomers. But I think that if, if you have people who have expressed an interest in doing something other than what your JCC is doing, then work with them to create programs that resonate with them. Um, you know, one idea that I've talked about um, with the one JCC is, that also happens to be intergenerational is, you know, why not create an urban garden? 
um, with your early childhood program. And right now there's one, and you know the teachers are primarily responsible for it because the kids clearly are just kind of helping. But you know, for people who are environmentalists and who are interested in green, um, you know, they could work with young children in maintaining that garden and in cooking and preparing Shabbat dinners and using the vegetables and those kinds and the fruits that grow there. So, um, you know, I would say that, again, go back and ask, you know, um, people like you, people like me, who skew, you know, uh, maybe to the left, and what are they looking for? Um, I'll tell you, what, uh, Boomers Leading Change, the project that I ran, we did a, a one-day symposium about a year ago for Adults 50 and Over in, in Denver, and um, one of the topics that we had we did a seminar on was, um, because it's Colorado, was about uh, pot. And, you know, you've got all these um, warnings if you're on, you know, blood thinners, you can't eat kale and you can't eat, you know, romaine, lettuce. But meanwhile, like, if you're t doing medical marijuana or if, if you're doing recreational pot, like, does anyone even talk about that? And so it was very well attended. Um, so there may be some alternative kinds of programs um, not necessarily on pot, mind you. That was just an example. But um, where if you bring the people in who are saying, you're not giving me the program that I, got, that I want, your stuff is too conservative, then what are you looking for? Let's do it. That's, that's why I go back to the dive-in piece. Let's do it. Let's experiment. You know, Come to the table. Let's have coffee. Tell me what you want. You don't want to learn how to play Mahjong? Fine. We won't play Mahjong. What, what do you want to learn how to do? Um, what are you interested in doing? You want to do a social action project? Do you want to hang out with little kids? Um, do you want to do a seminar on brain health? Which, by the way, was the most uh, attended seminar we had that day. It's a huge, huge thing, and I think there's just a ton of opportunity for JCCs to get involved in improving that. Uh, I'm going to advance my slide one, one more, so you can see there's my contact info. In case people want to email me um, or give me a call, I am Brainer Consulting. It's you know I'm starting this consulting business. I just moved to Metro West um, from Colorado, and I'm you know, this is a sweet spot for me working with the Jewish world and the Boomer world or adults 55 and over world. Um, I have a Facebook page called Aging Is Living, and um, I would be happy to consult with you on anything. Um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing most of you in March. Thank you, Barbara. Let me let me just uh, close so we can we can end on time. Um, uh, first of all, with a, a big thanks to to Barbara Rayner. Um, I, I hope uh, I hope you found that uh, as uh, interesting and useful as I did, and it really is intended to be a launching point. Um, so uh, um, three three follow ups, um, please. Take, take two minutes when you get the post-webinar survey to uh, um, give us a little bit of feedback on the past hour and to um, give us your thoughts about how JCC Association can be um, helpful uh, in this area moving forward. Um, if, you, um, if you're going to be at a professional conference, um, take, take, uh, be, be on the lookout for these sessions. Um, Barbara will be presenting uh, a couple times to the whole conference and to the adult track. Um, we also will be um, sharing the results of a, uh, a Jewish aging mastery program that JCCA piloted in six JCCs with the National Council on Aging. Um, we'll have uh, the, the VP for national branding of AARP uh, on, on site talking about how they uh, completely rebranded who they were, how they connected to the population, and, and what were the services and programs that they offered, uh, recognizing that they uh, they had skewed too old um, with their with their uh, um, offering. Um, and you can find out more about the professional conference at the website procon p r o c o n at jcca.org. Um, and finally, if there's anything um, I could do to be helpful, though. Uh, hesitate to reach out to me, Andy Taller. Uh, my email is really simple, a Taller, A T A L L E R at jcca.org. Um, so I, th I thank all of you. I thank uh, Marla for helping us field the questions, um, and uh, I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Andy.
Do it on my phone. 